So I guess as, uh, as the last speaker of the session, and uh, is, uh, she's going to close the session as well, uh, we have uh, Professor Luisa De Cola uh, from the University of Strasbourg. She's a professor of chemistry and uh, polymer science at the uh, Institute of Science and uh, of Supramolecular Engineering. And uh, she will be talking about design and biological characterization of mesoporous materials for drug delivery. Luisa, Thank it's you, all yours. Thank you and good afternoon. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. And uh, what I would like to share with you is uh, some story about mesoporous material. And uh, let me see how does this work. The big button is forward. Okay. So probably most of you know that mesoporous silica in particular has been used a very, quite a lot in the last few years for drug delivery and even also for biomolecules delivery. And uh, this is due to main f several factors. The first one is, of course, pores are interesting to capture and uh, uh, contain the molecules that can be very fragile. But also we can easily functionalize the surface of the material. And uh, on, on top of that, we can differentiate the, uh, the material in shapes, in pore size, and of course in size. But uh, there was a lot of debate about uh, degradability of this material. And uh, if you look at the literature, silica is reported to be degradable, and it can be degraded uh, over six months, or three months, or one month, or three days, or five days. And nobody really agrees with this number. And these numbers come from the fact that indeed it depends on the formulation and the, on the way you make the silica, depends on the porosity of the silica you make, and depends also, of course, on the shape and size. And so we decided uh, to uh, focus on this uh, particular point where the idea was uh, to create a silica that could not be degradable but could be breakable. So the idea was quite simple and indeed rely on the fact that when you construct mesoporous silica and you use a certain silica precursor, you can introduce in the silica framework organic groups. And this leads to the fact that, of course, uh, since we, as we learned from Professor Len uh, yesterday, we can introduce a covalent reversible group, like, for instance, uh, disulfide or uh, imines. And, and these are groups that can be indeed destroyed by uh, an external stimulus, like a reduction, uh, uh, like in the case of the disulfide, or a pH change. Or even uh, if you imagine uh, to have into the silica framework uh, something like a small peptides, like we have done indeed, you can enzymatically cleave the silica. And this opens a, a very interesting story because it means that your silica can be broken on demand and also that the fragments can be as small as two or three nanometers, depends as you make the silica, and therefore can be completely excreted. And so this is what I would like to show you how we do this material, and in particular I would like to show you the case of the disulfide, where you see in uh, these uh, very simple pictures uh, the construction of the particle and some characterization. And this particle indeed contains a disulfide bond, as you can see from the X analysis. And also you see very nicely that the particle, in this case, I'm sorry, uh, I missed the number here, is about 100 nanometer, and they are extremely monodispersed. But what is interesting about this particle containing the disulfide, the disulfide can be indeed easily broken because if you add a reducing agent like glutathione, that as we know is a natural reducing agent, you can really follow in real time the degradation of the particle, and in this case uh, the breaking of the particle in small fragments as small as 3 nanometers. And so this can occur over seven days, but it can occur occurs in three days or four days, and you can really establish the time you need to degrade the particle. And when we started this work, we were very excited. And after some uh, work in vitro, we immediately go in vivo to really look at the elimination of this particle from the animal bodies. And we noticed immediately that indeed after uh, uh, injection of this particle, the particle after three hours can reach either the liver. In this case, these are 100 nanometer particles that are decorated with peg chains. And in the case of smaller particles, they can also go into the lungs. But what is very nice is that, uh, indeed, uh, if you look at what happens after uh, about 40 hours, and these are uh, optical images of this particle, you observe the disappearance of the particle from the body of the animals. But we know that, of course, optical detection is not the most uh, preferred uh, uh, detection system. So we are doing the same with PET, and we have also looked at uh, the uh, histology of the animal after sacrificing the, the mice after one hour. Sorry and also after three days. And what you observe here is, uh, again, that after three days, indeed, that most of the particles are, are indeed gone 
from the uh, animals, and if you look indeed where they go, they go into the urines of these animals. So we have collected the urines and we have studied in detail what happened. So encouraged from these results, we decided uh, to uh, modify our synthetic approach, and we were able to make particles where you see that the pores are extremely large, up to eight nanometer. And they can positively charge so that you can imagine to entrap molecules like uh, siRNA, and this is what we have done. And the amount of siRNA on this particle can be quite large, up to 400 microgram per milligram of particle. And we have started to look indeed at the targeting of hepatocarcinoma using this type of particle after injection. And you see just a comparison here, these are very preliminary data, where we compare the effect of the uh, power particle with siRNA, and you see the decrease of the tumor size versus a control siRNA that has been linked to a peptide. And you see very nicely that essentially after already 10 days of treatment, the, the tumor size has a very strong decrease, and now we are monitoring out of uh, four months these uh, uh, mice to see what happens. But what is exciting about this story is also that uh, we can not only make mesoporous material, but we can make uh, particles that can encapsulate large molecules like uh, peptides or even uh, um, proteins or even enzymes. And this is very exciting because the way we proceed indeed is just the encapsulation of this biomolecule into a breakable material that has the same breakability that I showed you before. And therefore you would expect that, for instance, if we have disulfide or a means bond, we can easily break these bonds with a, an external stimulus in order to liberate the uh, biomolecules. And so, for instance, uh, if you look at the encapsulation of a small proteins like cytochrome C, and we use cytochrome C for obvious reasons because we can indeed identify the IMI group by spectroscopy, we see that we can form particles that are, again, extremely monodispersed. They are about 40 nanometers in diameter. And the question is, uh, where are the proteins? And the proteins are indeed in, inside because when you start to break adding just a glutathione, you can follow the kinetics of the release of the proteins, and you can also quantify by the UV absorption the number of proteins that are present per capsules, that in this case is about 32. But the question is again, where do the particle breaks? And if I look at the internalization of this particle into cells, we notice something very interesting, that if we just compare the breakability of the particle into the lysosome with non-breakable capsules, so these are just pure silica encapsulating the cytochrome C, you observe that after 48 hours, indeed, the pure silica particles are not able to degrade. However, if you look at the fate of our breakable silica particle with the cytochrome C, you observe very nicely that the particles start to break already after four hours, and essentially after 48 hours, they have left the cells. And where are they? They are indeed in the cell culture media, like we could detect by ICPMS. So this is opens, of course, very interesting question. What is the activity of these proteins when it is released? What is the activity of enzymes that can be released intracellular? And this is what we are studying at the moment in collaboration with our hospital. So in order to conclude, I would like just to show you one another example where this particle can be employed. And this can be maybe a little bit uh, strange for you because we never discussed this in this meeting. That is the possibility to introduce this particle into the formation of an hydrogel. And in particular, we use an hydrogel that is made at room temperature in water without any catalyst. And so once the gel is formed, of course, it will contain this uh, a porous material that can, of course, release a small molecule or even large molecules like proteins and can form this beautiful transparent gel that can contain up to 94% of water. And they are very porous, as you can see from this uh, very simple SEM picture. But what is very interesting for us is that these gels are perfectly uh, liquids and they can eventually be injected into the body of the animals. And this is what we had in mind, so the injectability of this material. And so what we have done was an extra vivo experiment where, where we observed the injection into the submucose of the stomach of pigs. And you see that, uh, the, in this case, we colored the gel with methylene blue. You see the distribution of the solution into these pockets. And now the question is, uh, do we really form the gel in this condition? Well, of course, uh, we do, and uh, you can see that after seven minutes, we can cut, indeed, after uh, we have injected the gels. And you see very nicely the gel formation that is perfectly adhering to the stomach of this animal. And so this brought us to a very real interesting application, that is the use of this gel for doing surgery, and in particular cancer surgery, in the case of uh, when you have cancer into the stomach. 
As you might know, of course, uh, when you have a, a stomach cancer, one of the problems is to avoid perforation of the stomach during surgery. And so what the people do is uh, to use a lifter as a solution, in, in general is a saline solution, in order to lift the submucose of the stomach and then to eliminate the tumor before this uh, goes down. But the problem is, as you can see here, that after one hour, everything is gone. So you have to re reinsert your solution. And this is very tedious for surgeon that has to do this uh, three, four, five times during the operation. And so what we have done was exactly the same study, but using our hydrogel that can not only lift uh, this uh, submucous stomach, but could also release uh, healing agents uh, like antibiotics or uh, just a self-healing system in order to repristinate in a much faster way the constitution of the uh, skin. And so this was the idea, and in, of course in this case, uh, both the hydrogel and the particle must be degradable because after two or three weeks, we should be able indeed to remove the material that we have injected. And now you observe here the real operation. So we have done this endoscopically, and these little spots represent the tumor in the uh, stomach of the pig. And now you see the injection of the gel as a liquid, but after three minutes, the gel is perfectly solid, and therefore the top of uh, the submucose, the, the, the region with the tumor, with the lesion, can be removed. And you see indeed that the gel can protect the underneath layer and can favor indeed the healing of, the, of this animal. And now the question is, how does this gel form in vivo in three minutes uh, since we have uh, injected as a liquid? And this is something we don't know yet. So uh, we are studying in detail uh, the formation of the gel you see here after we extract some of the gel uh, from the stomach. And we see very nicely the formation of this collagen fiber that are probably triggering the gel formation all, all over the place into the stomach uh, where we have injected. So with this, I would like to conclude. I would like to thank my people, and I would like, of course, to thank the fundings. And of course, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Luisa. Now it's even more clear what you in the title said, not only silicon, of course. The last slides are related to that. Open for question and curiosity, <laughs> Zenios. The, the uh, ability of the gel to polymerize in vivo does not depend on the silica or does depend on the silica and uh, the breakage of the silica? Yeah, it depends. Uh, uh, not, the, not on the breaking of the silica, but it depends on the presence of the silica as well because the silica increases elasticity of the gel in a dramatic way and the shape of the silica, of course, uh, uh, increases also the viscosity. So this is something that we are studying at the moment very much in detail. So the silica is very important for the gelation time and is important for the elasticity of the system and the mechanical properties of the gel. So it's a, it's a real component and of the gel. It connected to this, because Paolo knows something about this, because we've done some work on uh, silica enriched polymers. Uh, yes. And the problem is always how do you manage the distribution in the, uh, yeah. in the polymer? Because there is no way of really uh, organizing that. So can you say something about that? Yes. In our case, uh, we have uh, the silica covalently linked to the gel. And so we know exactly the distribution because uh, when we make our system, the silica particles are indeed our cross-linking unit. So we can dose with an exact amount, the amount of particle, and we can also space them as we wish. So they are not free into the gel. They are covalently linked to the structure of the gel. Yeah. Nice. nice. Any other comment, Avi, please? This is beautiful, really. Uh, I have a question about, I imagine it a little bit like an egg. So it enters the, the particle, the, the egg breaks, and the yolk uh, spills out. So do you actually, uh, uh, do you tune the thickness of, uh, of the shell? That's a very good question. At the moment, we are not able to tune the thickness of the shell, and not even the size, I have to say. So each uh, protein or enzyme will have its own size. So if we work with much larger uh, proteins or enzymes, we can go up to 80 nanometer instead of 40. And uh, this is due to the fact that we make this system in a nano emulsion. So we cannot really control the number of these uh, protein and enzyme that are uh, going to entrap it. What we can control is the size distribution that is very narrow because the number of enzymes or proteins are always the same. Uh, concerning the thickness of the shell, we don't really know. I mean, we don't even know if it is just a single shell or there is some silica that penetrates also inside, uh, 
to just create a kind of network inside. And this is due to the difficulties uh, that we have in terms of contrast to see by TM the difference between the protein and the silica containing the organic groups that are very similar in contrast. So we don't have a very good uh, TM picture at the moment to define the shell. What we know, however, is that the shell should be much thinner than the mesoporous material. And that's because the breakability is much higher. And so we know that in principle it should be thinner than that. Any other comment, please? Uh, concerning the data that you show on biodegradability in cells, yes. um, I was wondering, because uh, any silica material is in equilibrium with the solvent, and uh, silica like to re-precipitate re like amorphous silica, as amorphous silica, yes. and amorphous silica is very difficult to be seen and by time because it uh, has a low con contrast. Yeah. I was wondering if you did also ECP uh, analysis uh, to, to, yes. to be sure that silicon is not more in the cell. Yeah, so I mean, uh, the first things we did was this comparison with the non breakable and the breakable. They have exactly the same size and the same, uh, let's say, silica structure. The difference here, of course, is that we have the breakable group. So, what we notice is indeed that what you say, that we form immediately amorphous silica after the breaking, and eventually these disappear. And we were wondering where it goes. So, we repeat this several times with different cell lines. And at the end, we measure indeed that with by mass, I say PMS, the amount of silica not in the cell, but in the cell culture. And we found that most of the silica is in the cell culture, it's not anymore in the cell. So we, we don't know if the cell is expelled as a fragment immediately after, or when the cell, of course, undergoes into mitosis. So this is the, what we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. One last thing, yes. Yes. Have you checked uh, a longer time points? Because what happens with silica is that typically the cell decides to spit it out. Yeah. So it ends up in these multivesicular bodies and uh, what happens is that what you have is an exocytosed uh, process. Uh, yeah. that rather than a true <coughs> degradation, uh, the cell decides uh, to get rid of the yeah. uh, of the byproduct. Yeah. So we also checked that out of five days. This is the longest time uh, we check it. And uh, we, we observe essentially the same things and the cell keep dividing in a normal way. So this indicates also that probably they do not have any silica inside. So that what you said is correct. I mean, uh, that everything has been speeded up already after 24 hours. So, so that's why we decided then to look at the cell culture media because we could not really find any trace of silica. We also use a, a fluorescent silica because one of the beauty of this construction is that you can uh, also entrap into the silica uh, shell uh, fluorescent dyes, so you can really monitor what's happening during the fragmentation of the system. Yeah. In real time. In real time. Okay. If there are no other comments, I will thank again Professor Luisa Cola, and I will thank all the speakers of today. We got to the end only with five minutes late, so this is, I guess, already a great success. Coffee breaks. Thank you.